Hello fellow humans, my name is Poppy and I studied film and TV. That means I like talking about cinema, reading about cinema and going to the cinema a lot. So much so that back when I lived in Romania there were times I went to the cinema multiple times a weekend or even in the same day. To my English viewers, it is worth noting that ticket prices are a lot more affordable in Romania, even though a lot of the cinemas are newer and snazzier as well. But the price wasn't even the best bit, it was the diversity. It didn't matter if I was in an underground art house venue, an old communist building, or a swanky new theatre, I always knew I could find a range of films originating from Hollywood to Hungary. And I'm very grateful for the fact that I was able to do this because it taught me the importance of being exposed to other cultures through the medium of film. With what feels like an infinite supply of movies and series in our mother tongue, I feel like native English speakers tend to get a bit too comfortable and stick to what we know. I mean, I've had people tell me there's no point in watching things in other languages. But I beg to differ. The way these stories are told can often open our eyes to differences and similarities between our cultures. So not only is the literal language different, but the film language as well. Watching a foreign film exposes you to all kinds of newness. New approaches to comedy, new sound effects, new editing styles, new narrative structures, new settings, but most importantly, new subject matter. My favourite foreign films are the ones that feel unapologetically local. The ones that make me go, Hollywood could never. And Hollywood should never, because these stories deserve to be told by the people they actually belong to. And they also deserve to be watched around the globe like ours in English always are. I feel like we owe it to other cultures to return the favour. Now, without further ado, here are five foreign films you should watch right now. Or whenever you get the time, just give them a chance. Seeing as I mentioned watching Hungarian films earlier, let's start with one of my favourite films of all time, which also happens to be Hungarian, Kornel Mundrucos Fehir Isten, or as it translates in English, White God. When it came out in 2014, I liked it so much that I kept bringing different groups of people back to the cinema with me just so I could experience it again. I'd never seen any film quite like it, and nor have I since really. The main action begins when, in a cruel act of deception, protagonist Lily's father takes her and her mixed breed dog Hagen out for a drive, only to abandon Hagen in a far off road and drive home. Yeah, charming, I know. Following this incident, the film presents the perspectives of both Lily, the distressed owner, and Hagen, her lost dog, putting an unconventional spin on the standard parallel narrative. While the MacGuffin of this film is for the two of them to find one another again, we see Lily go on a more personal journey, facing challenges in tandem with her missing friend who finds himself in increasingly dire straits. As Hagen travels down a darkening path, Lily spends her days struggling to manoeuvre adolescent life without the support of her beloved companion. If this film had been produced by less imaginative people, it might be titled something like Revenge of the Dogs, but it's not that kind of movie. It's raw, it's honest, it's heavily rooted in a specific place and time, and it really helps you see through canine eyes better than any of the now-dated attempts that came before it. Yes, okay, the tone of something like Beverly Hills Chihuahua is very different, but you nevertheless feel a great human presence. What makes White God so good is the fact that it feels almost documentarian, like the chain of canine inflicted events, no spoilers, could or indeed would happen regardless of the presence of cameras, and there are definitely no voiceovers or unnerving CGI mouths to distract from the action. Honestly, there are so many technical aspects of White God that I adore, but for the sake of keeping things relatively concise, I just want to talk about the cinematography. The wide handheld takes throughout this feature complement the naturalistic direction and performance perfectly. But at the same time, they demonstrate a level of control that contains the madness just enough so as not to cause the viewers too much stress. Though the story, in principle, might feel far-fetched, it's presented so credibly that you need that safety net. And what a stunning net it is. The final shot of this film is, hands down, my favourite final shot of any film ever. It's so packed with emotion and symbolism and just downright beauty that I think the world needs to see it. So props to DOP Marcel Rev for that one. And as all good final shots should be, that's pretty representative of the film as a whole. Feyer Ishten is a gritty, never-before-seen tale of stress, 
separation and vengeance, told through an equal parts untamed and restrained lens. In conclusion, I love it, and I hope you do too. As we're on the subject of films with stunning camera work, we should also talk about Mahmoud Sabah's first feature, Baraka Meets Baraka. Now forgive me while I only use the English title, I don't know how to read Arabic. Having been released in 2016, it's also considered the first Saudi Arabian rom-com, and this fact alone tells us a lot about the Saudi relationship with cinema. Since the early 2000s, only a handful of films have been shot within the country and with a local cast, and because venues themselves were so scattered until 2018, very few of these films were even screened on home turf. So while the driving force of Baraka Meets Baraka is very much a love story, it exists as a commentary on the state of media in Saudi Arabia. The ways in which the film's characters interact with social platforms as well as one another provide an insight into life in this strictly regulated nation. But don't go thinking this film paints a bleak picture by any means. It's light-hearted and fun. Full of visual gags and dry comedy, it's truly a joy to watch. It just packs a more political punch as well. I have to confess though, when I was watching this film with my wholly European eyes, I laughed at what, to me, seemed like hyperbolic censorship. I thought the pixelation of bottles and certain billboards in the street was an editing choice made to heighten the message of censorship within the film. But it turns out, after doing some research, this might not have actually been a creative choice at all, but more of a requirement. So with that in mind, it only makes the existence of this boundary-pushing film even more impressive. Then you add the fact that it's a romantic comedy on top of that? I mean, whoa! <laughs> the kind of flirtation, secret meetings, general rule-breaking that these characters get up to not only challenges the norm, but in some cases the law. So who are these characters? Well first, we have the titular Baraka. He's a seemingly unremarkable man who goes about his days fulfilling his civic duty and upholding the law within the capital city of Riyadh. But despite his job, he's actually a pretty laid-back dude, and it's his lens through which we, the audience, experience the life and culture of his town. Then there's his love interest, Bibi. Bibi is frankly quite a revolutionary, or as much as she can be from behind her screen. Her personal rebellion predominantly takes place on Instagram, where she spreads empowering messages and words of wisdom to her audience without even showing her face. These two characters, with their opposing energies but harmonious views, complement one another perfectly and make for a truly compelling and human story. Speaking of beauty, don't think I forgot how I introduced this film. Victor Credi's cinematography is captivatingly vibrant, making particularly zesty use of the widescreen format, and this attractiveness is only heightened by the saturation of the grade. I think Western films love to make Middle Eastern palettes very beige and light brown oriented, but Baraka Meets Baraka doesn't hold back at all. The vibrancy of each hue seems to mimic the energy that the characters send one another, and not only that, but it just reminds us that Saudi Arabia might not always be as Hollywood portrays it. With its defiance of Western norms and simultaneous commentary on Saudi Arabian media, Baraka Meets Baraka is a truly unprecedented piece that reminds us things may not always be as they seem, or in some cases are repeatedly presented to us. So if that kind of thing interests you, please check it out and let me know what you think. Another film that deals with image and perception, but on a much more intimate level, is Céline Sciamma's 2011 French feature, Tomboy. According to Google, this story revolves around a young transgender who is introduced to her neighbourhood as a boy, but feels alienated in the society. Now, this is a slightly problematic synopsis, so I just want to take a moment to address it. You see, this description unfortunately exemplifies the exact kind of mentality that Tomboy as a film is attempting to highlight, and in a way could actually undermine the message of the film and potentially deter people from watching it. The film is actually about a young transgender boy who introduces himself to his new neighbourhood as Mikhail in order to escape the way he feels at home where his parents unknowingly misgender him and use his birth name. So here's why the way it's written on Google isn't great. When the writer uses the adjective transgender as a noun, not only is the sentence grammatically incorrect, but it also reminds me that, often, people intentionally misuse this term as a noun to ridicule and dehumanise trans people. If you don't believe me, but injecting transgender found not guilty 
is just one example of an NBC Miami headline that actually exists. And there's a lot more journalism like that out there, but when you think about it, it really makes no sense. I mean, replace the word transgender with any other adjective, and what even is that sentence? The writer also misgenders the main character, calling him she, which is such a classic example of ignorance that I wonder if they even actually watch the film. If this seems insignificant to you, just try and put yourselves in the shoes of a young trans boy who's looking for stories like his, trying to understand what's going on with him, and he hears of this one film that sensitively portrays his experience, so he goes to Google to find out more, and essentially is told, no, actually, you are a girl. It would feel pretty awful, to say the least. With all that said, please just note that this brief synopsis doesn't suit the tone of Tomboy one bit, and in fact, it just reiterates why we really need more films like this out there to educate ourselves. So let's return to the recommendation. Tomboy exists as a window into the trans experience through one very specific example, and in addition to providing solace for fellow trans people, I think it mainly exists to help cis people like myself understand the daily experience of a trans person. In a nutshell, Tomboy is a touching piece of art that illustrates Mikhail's discomfort with the gender he was assigned at birth. He's very much alone in his turmoil, but when he and his family move to a new home, he has the chance to adopt a new masculine name, introduce himself to all the kids in his neighbourhood as a boy, and be masculine presenting in every possible way. In fact, it takes a while before even the audience can confidently say he isn't cisgender, but let me tell you when it does happen, the moment is quietly moving. And you know, I'd actually use those words to describe the film as a whole. Tomboy is full of emotionally driven moments, delivering the dramas of first love and new friendships, all with the added tension of a major secret. There are some truly tender and saddening moments that, as a cis person, made me really reflect on how lucky I am that my mind matches up with my body. My favourite aspect of this film, however, is the relationship Mikhail has with his younger sister, Jeanne. She and Mikhail have such natural chemistry as siblings that you'd think the actors were related. Their performances are full of childish innocence, and I found myself awing at the screen many times. In my experience, anyway, American films rarely portray positive sibling relationships, so it was really refreshing to see this French interpretation. But of course, cuteness only gets you so far. What really stands out is their immaculate acting. I won't hesitate to call this pair a couple of prodigies, to be honest. And it goes without saying that the emotions Zoe Eran, actress for Michael, manages to capture demonstrate an admirable level of maturity. But honestly, the entire cast is adept at staying raw and real. I think even if this film hadn't tackled such an important topic, the performances would still impress, but fortunately it is socially and culturally significant as well. So if you want to see proper international talent displayed in a culturally significant piece, I encourage you to watch Tomboy. And now, for another film that centres on the youth, and another one of my all-time favourites, Lucas Morison's Fi er Best, or We Are the Best in English. Fun fact about this one, it's actually an adaptation of the graphic novel Never Good Night, which was written by none other than Morison's wife, Coco. That's pretty cute if you ask me, and it also explains why the story has such a genuine feminine energy running through it, which is crucial to the credibility and heart of the film. Set in 1982 Stockholm, We Are the Best first introduces us to the characters of Bobo and Clara, two androgynous 13-year-old girls ostracised by their peers for their love of punk rock and alternative ways. When the boys at their local youth centre, who play in a rock band called Iron Fist, begin picking on the girls, they decide their best form of retaliation is to form a much cooler punk rock band. The only downside? Neither of them knows how to play an instrument or even sing. This is when they enlist the help of Hedvig, whose classical guitar performance at the school talent show stuns them with its beauty. And despite her Christian upbringing and delicate ways, Hedvig agrees to mentor them and become a part of the band. And thus we have the setup for a delightfully honest portrayal of young teens and their desperate, potentially naive, attempts at fitting in and striving for rock greatness. The film is both adorable and awkward, but not without substance. In addition to witnessing the main narrative of the girls and their band, we also gain a lot of insight into their home lives and the differing family dynamics. These fundamental differences are the source of much of the film's tension, 
And again, I don't want to give too much away, but yeah. <laughs> Overall, it's a very easy film to watch. It's feel-good, sure, but not in the forgettable way that so many Hollywood flicks are. It's heartwarming, it's empowering, it's funny in an understated way, and it reminds you of when you were younger, even if you never formed an all-girl punk rock band out of spite. You probably didn't. Also, it's Swedish, which is just an added bonus for me personally. But most importantly, and I did touch on this earlier, it's credible. I first watched the Erbest years ago, and I'm still 100% on board with all the characters. They're just kids being kids, and it's great to be able to watch them do that, so go and watch it. And last, but certainly not least, I want to tell you about Tuna Girl, the 2019 Japanese export, pun intended, by Mana Yasuda. First off, and this is probably just my own personal experience, but nevertheless, I find the title so intriguing that when I first saw the poster for this film, I had to watch it straight away, and I think that's a testament to Yasuda's ability to hook an audience. I mean, it worked on me anyway. I just realised hook is another pun. I keep doing that, it's not, it's not even intentional, whatever. So yeah, I'm so glad that I took the time to watch this film because I feel all the more enlightened for having done so. From a stylistic standpoint, Tuna Girl is probably the most distinctly non-Western film I've witnessed to date. From the sights, to the sounds, to the subject matter, it's the perfect example of a film that could only take place in one country. The story had to be set in Japan, and the movie could only be produced by a Japanese cast and crew, and that's what makes it so special. I mean it. Every detail is unmistakably local. I won't be able to play it for copyright reasons, but even in the trailer you can catch a glimpse of the delightfully Japanese soundtrack. And I know it seems obvious that a Japanese film would have Japanese music, but it just makes me really happy when non-English speaking films and media don't feel the need to cater to the English speaking audiences. And even on the visual side of things, the graphics feel so Eastern. From titles, to capgens, to live comments coming in through a stream within the film, everything is just slightly different and makes me realise how much more I have to learn about the technological differences between our cultures. You know, I think Western media needs more bright pink neon text in our newscasts. So those are two reasons the film feels Japanese. But I also mentioned a need for it to be, and that's where the plot comes in, which funnily enough I haven't mentioned yet, so let's get to that, shall we? Tuna Girl is about a cheerful yet painfully clumsy student named Minami, who takes up a placement at a seaside research facility. But she struggles to fit in with her more scientifically minded and serious peers, often making a fool of herself and sometimes with very serious consequences. Now, I don't want you thinking this is a simple slapstick comedy. I mean, yes, I did find myself laughing at the number of times she fell, especially with how cartoonishly she did so, but I think Tuna Girl has an extra special element that most comedies in this style just don't. And that's a message. But even more special than the message itself is its delivery. Because we attend and discover this fishery through Minami's eyes, we're basically learning alongside her. We sit and have meals with her, we join her small classroom cohort, and we basically make every mistake that she makes. I know that's not that groundbreaking necessarily, but what I found so special was the way things are explained to her and also feel like they're explained to us at the same time. I mean, I finished this film having learnt so much about tuna, and as someone who eats a lot of sushi, it was really interesting to hear about Japan's relationship with this product and how it extends to the rest of the world. I felt like I was watching a fusion between comic fiction and nature doc. It was really interesting to experience and see. But it doesn't feel like a lecture either, it's just a really informative story. So even if you don't like learning stuff, I still recommend this film because it's wacky, it's fun, it'll definitely lighten your mood. Okay, I can't actually 100% guarantee that it will lighten your mood, please don't come for me if it doesn't. But for me, it, it worked, it's positive and happy and stuff, so... At the end of the day, all art is subjective, and I can only hope that at least one of you out there enjoys one of the films I've recommended today. And if you have any suggestions for me, I do intend to make more of these videos, I've got a list already, so feel free to put them in the comments below. And as always, if you enjoyed this content and 
might maybe possibly look forward to more, then please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching, goodbye!